Jamal Nyaz here with the legend Enzo at For Love of Wrestling with Monopoly Events. Now, I know all the fans have been so excited to have you over here in England. It's been a while. How amazing has it been to catch up with the fans and some old friends? Uh, honestly, uh, it, yes. And you mentioned some old friends. Uh, a lot of guys I haven't seen, like the likes of Dolph Ziggler, uh, formerly known as, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm formerly known as Enzo Amore, but I got to tell you, everywhere the fuck I go in this world, I hear, how you doing? It's Enzo, right? I answer to Enzo. Who am I not to, right? Hulk Hogan, uh, The Rock, they're lucky enough to own their names. I don't own Enzo, but I definitely answer to it. So I'm not mad at it. Thanks to all the fans who recognize me, especially the ones over here. It's humbling to have fans anywhere that's not a uh, home for me, honestly. Uh, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey, and I grew up looking at New York City, not realizing that it is the biggest, greatest city in the world. And every time, like, I, I grew up, uh, you ever heard of the Dallas Cowboys? Yeah. I, mean, I know, right? So you've heard of the, the Dallas Cowboys? Well, shit, there was a lot of prestige to that name when I was growing up. In my brain, I built up Dallas, Texas to be this metropolis that was just like New York City because the Dallas Cowboys were from Dallas. And I'll never forget the first time I flew into a major city because I never flew before I was a wrestler, right? I was a broke kid. I, we went to the Jersey Shore for the summer. We fly into Dallas. I'm looking out the window like, where the fuck is Dallas? Where the hell is Dallas? What are they talking about? These cowboys? And they're like, that's Dallas. I'm like, what? So I've been humbled to come to find out up until I flew to Tokyo that uh, there really ain't another skyline or city like the one I grew up looking at. But uh, it's different when, you you know, like Sinatra, I, I grew up looking at it. I wasn't in it. So um, you can make it there. You can make it anywhere. And the WWE, WWF is known as New York. That's what we called it. when it, Back when it was territory wrestling, New York. When you got called to New York and you were a guy from the South or something like that, they were talking about the WWF, modern-day WWE. So I grew up on that, not knowing about wrestling that happened all over the world, like World of Sport here in the UK and all the Japanese uh, promotions that run over there so prominently, bringing uh, major figures from the United States world of wrestling over there. I had no idea growing up that what I was watching was the biggest sport in the world, WWF in Madison Square Garden, and it never got bigger than that. So uh, it's been a blessing to just see the world doing what I love and uh, it gets, it, it, well, it doesn't get any bigger than New York City. This world is huge, and pro wrestling affords you the opportunity to see it. It's a great job. I recommend it to any kid out there that watches it, likes it, and wants to do it. If I could do it, you could do it. 100%. And you showcase that gift of the gab that you've just shown there. Day one debut NXT against Mason Ryan. You come out, and I was reading the comments. I was reading the comments on the YouTube video, and everyone was saying you could see that was a star right there, Enzo, from the get-go. He was he, well, amazing. I just, I'll say this. I don't read the comment section, <laughs> okay? I, I keep my nose out of the comment section, man. So that's funny. Uh, hey, man, th thanks to Mason Ryan. Uh, takes two to tango, and... Um, you know, you, you never make it in this business without the other guy helping you. So, um, you know, I, I, I just, I'm blessed. Uh, they didn't make me who I am. They found me like this. Yeah. I was able to, I wasn't scared to talk to nobody from the second I got an opportunity. So, uh, to all the kids out there that want to do this thing, man, I'm telling you, um, you know, the, the world's your oyster in, in, in when it when it comes to manifesting this vision. You know, when I first said my name is Enzo Amore, I'm a certified gene, a bona fide stud, and you can't teach that. The first time I said it was in a mirror, right? I wasn't saying it to fans. I was saying it to hear how it sounded coming out of my lips. And uh, it tasted good. And it, and it felt like maybe I should try this in front of people. But it takes a lot of that trial and error. So if you're a young kid trying to figure out what works for you, don't be afraid to look ridiculous, to seem ridiculous, and to come across. You got to put yourself out there if you want to make it. So don't be afraid of what critics are going to say about you. If I was scared about all those things at the beginning of my career, I would have never made it. So I'm sure there's a lot of people saying things about me in the comment section. But I didn't worry about that. Right? You got to be able to phase that noise out. And worry about what you can control. And uh, the things that were in my control was that character development, was writing down the promos, was, uh, you know, 
when you write a book that's this big and uh, you pull f- five letter word out of it, S A W F T soft, you had to write a lot more than five letters to find that word and to say it in the right moment. So there's no such thing as a coincidence. Uh, you, you work hard. Uh, as a pro wrestler, when you get in the ring and the bell goes ding, you're going to be able to showcase what you learned as a wrestler. If you worked hard on writing and performing your promos, no different than any great actor who wants to play a role. When Heath Ledger wants to play Joker, he's got to look in the mirror. He's got to rehearse his lines. He's got to get into that character, and he's got to create something that when you see it, you go, that guy worked hard on that, right? Well, it's easy to see hard work when a guy has it on his body. Like when uh, Lex Luger, the narcissist, walks to the ring, Vince McMahon at that time checked a box on that resume. He said, that guy works hard. That's undeniable. When I see Goldberg's physique, when I see Brock Lesnar, I know that man works hard just by looking at him. I know he's in the gym. He takes care of his nutrition, and he works hard in the gym. That is easy to see. But when somebody's working hard on the promo or the acting, you only get to see that when they get their opportunity to showcase it. It doesn't just walk in the room with them. They got to be able to separate that character from that person, but be able to turn it on when the opportunity presents itself. So uh, to all those people out there that maybe aren't seven feet tall, that are not big, that, that don't have that that thing about them that jumps off the screen, you could still jump off the screen when given your chance if you work hard at that particular thing. So whether it be the charisma, the promo, I know that Bailey, uh, when she got into the WWE, she didn't know what to do with her hands. Like in, uh, like in Talladega nights, what do I do with my hands? I'm on camera. And, uh, she would just be nervous. So dusty Rhodes said to her, okay, we'll play that nervous character up. When you come out here, just say, I'm nervous. Uh, I don't know what to say. Can I have a hug? And she gives the person a hug. And all of a sudden, we love that person because they're vulnerable. They're showing that they don't have the confidence to go out here and just rip it on the microphone. And that's something that everybody in the audience can relate to. So it made Bailey relatable. And then she got her confidence. And now Bailey rocks the mic in the main event of Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. So that thing that I have that you can't teach, it can be taught. I've seen it taught. And if you're a young wrestler who's maybe not feeling the promo or not as, uh, you know, reluctant to go out there and just rip it, I would say you just keep at it. Just keep keep going, and uh, it'll come to you eventually. And John Cena recognized that talent in you straight away from that night, didn't he? He was a, he was a massive supporter of you yeah. and really, really helped you out in that situation, didn't you? Because you were scratching and clawing and with all the scratching and clawing that you were doing to, to reach the pinnacle of where you got to, sometimes it doesn't hurt to have a helping hand and to have it from one of the greatest superstars of all time, that must have been a, a massive, massive praise coming from him. Uh, yeah, no, one in a, once in a lifetime opportunity. It's funny, um, I noticed that recently uh, somebody was tagging me and it said that John Cena makes his NXT debut recently, like on TV. Yeah. And I thought to myself, that motherfucker already been in NXT, man, because he already made somebody over there <laughs> and he made me. I owe that guy a lot. So does Cass. Uh, and it wasn't just me, bro. Um, I was a part of a tag team. And without him, I couldn't have done it. Without me, he couldn't have done it. We were married to each other in the business for six years. Um, and and uh, I couldn't have done it without him. So um, it was both of us. It was me and Cass. And John Cena helped us tremendously. On the night I debuted, he asked me to come to the ring with him. I told John Cena that I had a tag team partner who was Big Cass. Now it's me and Cass in the ring with John Cena and Damian Sandow. I used the word soft in the promo. I said, intellectual savior of the masses damian sandow this guy's seven foot tall and you can't teach that and we got soft we got how you doing and we got all those words uh in the promo right there with john cena and he repeated the word soft and then the crowd repeated it and the rest was history i was booked every weekend pretty much for the rest of my career um 
And that's all it takes is that lightning in a bottle. So as a wrestler, you just got to be prepared for the moment. And um, I can honestly tell you when I got out there against Sandow, I was ready for the moment. I had jokes written about Damian Sandow. And two of those jokes became catchphrases that were on T-shirts that were written um, and rehearsed around the world by uh, fans. So certified G, bona fide son, you can't teach that. Big class, seven foot tall, and you can't teach that. Well, it's all owed to the intellectual savior of the masses, Damian Sandow, who is smart. If it wasn't for that guy being in that promo, I don't say that stuff. But being prepared for those moments uh, is what it takes to be a pro at the highest level. So if you want to be ready with your promo, you better have a joke written on every single person on the roster or multiple and how much time does it take to do that a lot of time but what else are you doing if i'm a developmental i'm writing around the clock about all the people that are in the room and when i have an opportunity to go out there and that person's name gets called i'll be ready that that is amazing work ethic and i think you're one of the very few if not probably the only one at that time i I, I think i i I think i remain the only one i don't know anybody who's you can be put on the spot like that if you get thrown in the ring with anybody i got something for each and every one of your asses yeah that but that's that's me and um different strokes for different folks different things work for different people and some guys will tell you they just got to freestyle their promo that's all good and fine i wrote down all my promos uh i came into it prepared and um, through that process, I was able to articulate ad lib and 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 draw upon the crowd um, in moments time, change everything I had written. So there's that ranginess that you develop through writing. Uh, and I find that there's no other skill that gives you that opportunity. Um, writing is the most important recipe to become a great promo in pro wrestling. Um, and... Some of the greatest promos in pro wrestling are probably the writers who are writing the promos for the boys, but they don't have to go out there, deliver them. And maybe they can't, maybe they just don't have that ability to go out there and pick up that mic and do it in front of a crowd. But backstage, they could pen these promos for them. So if I'm a wrestler, I'm saying, fuck that. I'm going to write more than the writers do. That's your job. Nah, I'm going to make that my job too. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're writing your promos and you're and you're and you're able to say them on TV and you're getting um, creative liberties and and having fun with it. So, uh, you know, nothing's given. Everything's earned. If you get this microphone in your hand, that's the lifeblood of a company. You can't curse. You can't, you know, say the wrong thing, whether that, you know, that was the way it was when I was there. So I can't speak to it now. And we can see everyone can see your passion for the industry every time you speak about it. Including this interview right now, I can I can see it. You've got star power written all over you. You always have. Everyone wants to see you back on television. Now I know that AEW isn't in your sights right now, but could it be at some point? Um, I mean, look it. I I I've never. Uh, I guess I they say never say never in this business. So. It's just one of those, man, where it's like uh, I don't never say never. I just think, that, man, I worked really hard to build the brand of Enzo Amore, uh, SAWFT Soft, the Certified G thing, all of that stuff Mm -hmm. is there for the taking. Uh, It only exists in one place, and I could only be Enzo Amore in one place. So, um, you know, I've had fun wrestling these past few years, uh, done some – Scattered about work, haven't signed a deal with anyone, have not been back on television. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to dive into the thing that I love, and that is actually wrestling. I know that the promo is probably what I'm known for, but I've been doing a lot of seminars with young wrestlers. Uh, I've been working with Al Snow and OVW. Um, and the show that they do on Thursday nights there, uh, is a great house. I, I really, I watched wrestlers on Netflix, which was amazing. And I suggest anybody who hasn't seen wrestlers on Netflix, go watch it. Uh, just to see a moment that there was on the show that I could kind of like correlate and pull from, um, to, as to what made me really want to go to OVW and work with this, this roster of talent. It's like, man, this guy cash flow. 
who's on OVW. He's got his wife, his kid, his family. He, they, he feeds them through wrestling, right? And, you know, he's not making a million dollars, but he gets a shot to go on AEW Dark. And watching that moment where him and his family are sitting in their house, and you can just kind of see him cheesing. Like, this is his moment. He's on TV. And just to see what it means to those people, you got to be able to take yourself out of this thing and say, yeah, I was a star. Yeah, I've done this thing on TV. Yeah, I've done this. But holy shit, do you remember what it was like the first time you did it? Do you remember what that moment was like for your family, for your friends, for the people? Uh, it may get old in time and may seem like monotony, but when you get to see it happen for other people, um, and take yourself out of it and just think about, wow, like, oh, wow. Like, um, sometimes it means so much to my opponent to just get in the ring with me. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't look at it like that at all, bro. I'm just like a normal guy, right? Just a normal <laughs> dude who got a shot with this company, but it's where you want to get to. So you're a young kid. You're 23 years old. You paid for yourself to go to wrestling school. You, you know, you busted your ass to chase this dream. And here you get an opportunity to learn from me, a guy who's been to the top in the WWE, who's wrestled with John Cena and AJ Styles and, you know, all you name them. So, damn, you just got to, if you're me, sometimes be like, okay, Eric, well, you actually did that shit. Like, so maybe somebody does want to hear what you got to say. Because me, I'm always like, dude, who who am I to give advice? Like, I'm not going to. I hate it when somebody gives me advice, so I'm not going to tell you what to do. But then you're like, man, these people are really eager to know the little things that you know uh, about being in the ring, uh, spatial awareness, how you're feeding for something, um, why you do something or why you sell something a certain way at this point in the match and and just little things that I take for granted because I went to the Harvard of pro wrestling and I learned from the best coaches in the world. If you think that I went through the curtain anytime in Gorilla in NXT and Triple H was on the other side of the curtain and it was okay for us to go out there and do this or do that. or No, tight script, dog. We went out there and did our job, whoever that was. You're, there's eight matches on a card. You're in match one. You're in match eight. Your your role is this. Your role is that. And to a to a spec, what they ask you to do. So it was almost more difficult in the days of NXT than it obviously was by the time I'm on Raw. And honestly, it was more lax. Uh, the, the, the competitive environment of NXT, just wanting to get on TV, wanting to get to Raw, going out there and killing yourself every night, trying to put on the best match you could, hoping that somebody would see it and you'd get a shot. Like that environment is what makes you the great pro. So um, Hunter and the developmental system and the coaches that they have, it's the greatest system in the world. It's never been done before. And I was a part of it when it was in its inception. Mm -hmm. So I went from Florida Championship Wrestling to painting the walls of the NXT Performance Center, building the weight room equipment and putting together every ring. I was a part of something that was crazy. Dusty Rhodes is no longer here. So, like, when I meet a guy on the indies and he's genuinely thirsty for this knowledge that I have, it's very fulfilling to get in the ring and not be Enzo Amore and running around backwards and screaming at the top of my lungs, but to be the coach, to be the guy who explains why are we doing this and why we don't care about what the chirpers on the internet are saying about this thing. They've never taken a bump in their life. You're fucking, you're worried about those people? Like, dude, you think I care about whether or not they think I know how to do an arm drag when I'm a number one merchandise seller in the entire fucking world? What would you rather be? The guy on the internet getting praised for his arm drags or the guy on the internet getting buried because he's the number one merchandise seller in the world? I lived it. I was there. And I got to learn from those coaches. And uh, I know that I had the best education in the history of our business. So there's a lot I have to offer in pro wrestling that goes beyond um, my name is Enzo Amore. <laughs> it's uh, it's fun to do it, um, but it's been even more gratifying in my, um, in my prime right now, I find mentally as a professional wrestler to, you know, work with younger talent and uh, help them raise their level of, you know, performance.